This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. A human rights expert talks about torture. A political analyst says Republicans now have to show they can govern. And Bill Press talks with former Congressman Dennis Kucinich. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Professor Eric Posner has written a book basically saying that human rights interventions usually don't work. And he explains when torture and other extreme measures work and when they don't. And we say hello to Eric Posner, Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. His current research interests are international law and constitutional law, and his new book is called The Twilight of International Human Rights. Eric Posner, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. My pleasure. Glad to be here. And nice to have you with us. Uh, Your book focuses on an issue of great concern to progressives, human rights. But you argue that human rights law has failed to accomplish its objectives, and there is little evidence that it has actually improved people's lives at all. Is this part of the law of unintended consequences? Absolutely. The law of unintended consequences plays a significant role when it comes to human rights. You know, the problem is, is that the human rights uh, agenda or the human rights law is based on a kind of utopian premise that everyone is better off with human rights. Uh, and, you know, while there, that's true, at least in the abstract, when when we try to put that agenda into practice and try to compel countries that don't respect human rights to change their behavior, what often results is disorder Um, And ultimately, from the disorder, often what you get is a a new form of authoritarianism, which uh, doesn't respect any uh, human rights any more than the old regime did. If the United States steps into some someplace like an Iraq is a good example. Okay, we 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 get rid of the leader, but then we have all of these uprisings and all of these people standing up and everybody wants their own. And it, it turns into complete disarray. But isn't this giving them an opportunity to speak up for themselves? It did. You know, the United States stepped into Iraq and um, what everyone thinks of the war, one of the biggest mistakes was to eliminate the old regime, the Baathists, to disband the army, to disband the bureaucracy. And it was understandable because the Baathists, who were Sunnis, had oppressed the majority of the population who consisted of Shiites. But the problem with doing that is you get rid of the most uh, educated people, the people with skills. And um, even though they're now just a minority, you you can't run a country where a large minority is... um, Uh, excluded from power. Then the Shiites uh, come into power. Um, Obviously, they're going to make mistakes because they don't have much uh, experience with democracy. They do make those mistakes. Uh, The Sunnis fight back, and basically what we have is a civil war. As bad as uh, Saddam Hussein's reign was, uh, it was not as bad as the current uh, uh, situation where you have the Islamic State roaming around beheading, crucifying, and enslaving its uh, enemies. Almost a case of be careful what you wish for. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, you are highly skeptical of human rights law and foreign policies built on human rights. But since our own revolution, hasn't America been the beacon, the city on the hill, if you will, that, that oppressed people look up to? Well, we like to tell ourselves that, and and to some extent um, it's true. Certainly in the 18th and 19th century, uh, the United States had a political system that was much more attractive than that in uh, most of the rest of the world. But the original idea of the city on the hill was that we would produce a good society, and then other people could look at what we're doing and imitate it if if they could. And I certainly don't have any objection with that. But that's not what people mean when they talk about modern human rights law. Human rights law means that we need to force other countries to be like us. And coercing other countries to adopt our system or a system like ours leads to this problem of unintended consequences that we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. 
Why do countries practice torture, kidnapping, extrajudicial killings? Is it because they work or, or more because oppression is a natural outgrowth of power, as we've seen in many social psychology experiments here in America? Well, I think, I think the answer is yes to both of, your, both of your questions. I mean, in many countries, these practices do work as horrible as they are. If you have a tremendous amount of civil disorder, it may only be possible to end it by using uh, uh, extreme methods that would be abusive in a country that is, um, uh, you know, that has a, has a democracy or that has a, a great deal of, of civil order. Um, but it's also the case that um, leaders uh, of uh, authoritarian countries sometimes do get carried away. They become megalomaniacs. They become paranoid. Maybe they go insane sometimes. There are famous examples of these. And they engage in abuses that are um, far beyond you know, what might be justified for the sake of maintaining order in a place uh, that's uh, fractious. Mm -hmm. but, but I actually think that this is rather a rare exception. Dictators who act in a crazy way are usually replaced, uh, not always by democratic revolutions, but by the elites in the country who, uh, you know, may not mind a dictator, but they want a dictator who, who maintains order rather than one who does crazy things. So the people themselves draw their own line. Yeah, as a, as a, I mean, dictators are very rarely people uh, who, who, you know, just do what they feel like doing. Most dictators have to contend with um, clans, uh, groups of various sorts, minorities. They, they have to keep them happy, at least at some level. And when they don't, um, they're replaced by you know, their subordinates, by lieutenants, uh, by other leaders. So um, this is what generally keeps dictators within line. Do you say then that, that there is no foreign policy value in speaking out and acting on behalf of human rights in other countries? Uh, I think there is a foreign policy value in speaking out uh, about human rights, but it has to be done in a prudent way, and it's not always done in a prudent way. People in foreign countries often resent being scolded by the United States. Um, as, uh, as many people know, the United States itself is not able always to respect human rights law, and it's certainly complicit in the human rights violations of allies like Saudi Arabia. So when the United States scolds other countries, people think that it's being hypocritical and, and, and probably even more, more often unrealistic. The sorts of rights that can be respected in established Western democracies may be luxuries in countries that have only recently emerged from colonialism that have huge ethnic and religious divisions. And so people hearing uh, us scold them often think, and probably rightly, that we just don't understand the problems and challenges in their countries. We're speaking with Eric Posner, Kirkland and Ellis, Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago and author of the book, The Twilight of International Human Rights. And, and there are, of course, examples of failures. But what about American intervention against ethnic cleansing in Kosovo? Was that not a success? And then what are your thoughts about Libya? Kosovo was a success. Um, it's hard to deny that. But we also need to think carefully about what will happen in the long term. It's not yet clear that Kosovo is a viable state. Libya was a disaster. Um, we intervened in Libya in order to prevent a massacre, which was certainly understandable. But the uh, upshot is that Libya's dictator, Gaddafi, was overthrown. And it turns out that whatever his uh, defects as a leader, and there were many, he was at least able to keep Libya from descending into civil war. Now Libya is in civil war, and uh, the place is, you know, is, is, is a nightmare. A uh, similar thing could be said by, uh, about Iraq. So I, I wouldn't rule out uh, humanitarian interventions, but I think one has to be very careful about them, and they probably are not worth doing unless it's politically possible for us to go in for the long term. Mm -hmm. But, and I understand that point, but how, how do you know when? How do you, when do you know when's the right time? I mean, at some point, don't you have to get in and help people? I, I mean, think sometimes, given, given that we have the power to do that. Yes, I do think we, we do have to go in and help people. I don't think it's possible to set out, set out in advance 
a bunch of rules that that tell you when when we should and when we shouldn't. I, I think ultimately, it's a complicated moral and political decision. There, there's a very there's a very good reason to think, for example, that we should have intervened in Rwanda, while I do think we should not have intervened in Libya. Now, how, how does one reconcile these sorts of views? The, the one of the key questions is whether the public will give support to a medium or long-term intervention. Another question is just how um, how uh, uh, intensive and 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 long-term the intervention has to be. It may be possible sometimes to stop a massacre from taking place, and then one can leave, and and that's fine. Maybe the country will revert to. Uh, the way it was before. But if you have significant conflict that's only going to be worked out in some kind of massive civil war that's going to go on for years or decades, we really have no choice. Either we we intervene and try to settle the civil war, which is incredibly difficult uh, and, and probably um, you know, unwise in, in most cases, or we just have to wait. I think the sort of one-off interventions uh, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, they'll make things better. Well, what are the conditions then for 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 when intervention or or, or can or will be launched? Well, uh, I I would hesitate about setting out conditions just because of the complexity of the world. I, I think uh, the, the the president, for example, if, if he's the one who makes this decision, or Congress, or or other Western countries have to think very carefully about the political conditions in the country in which an intervention might seem uh, justified. If, uh, for example, the country has a dictator who engages in a lot of human rights abuses, uh, and we think, well, we can just remove the dictator, um, it's very likely that if we remove the dictator, uh, some kind of war would erupt among various factions who want to take power. And if that's likely, it's very unwise to engage in a humanitarian intervention, unless we also think that we'd be able to go and intervene and, and settle a civil war, which which basically, you know, we've never done and, and, and is all but impossible. Mm -hmm. But there may be other conditions where a short-term humanitarian intervention uh, would work. You know, Kosovo was a different situation because the European Union had a lot more interest in what was going on there. Serbia was isolated, and there were significant sort of pro-West people in Serbia. Uh, so uh, I, I think one can only evaluate humanitarian interventions on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Now, before we let you go, you suggest that human rights activists take a more humble approach. Does that mean abandoning formal attempts to impose change and working at the margins on specific issues? Yeah, something like that. I guess I would suggest the following. I think it's it's wrong to try to imagine that we can uh, apply a, a whole human rights framework, something that resembles liberal democracy or social de democracy, and demand that developing countries or authoritarian countries comply with comply with it. But we can still help people in other countries, and I think the way that we should help people in other countries is not to impose our values on them, but to figure out um, how, uh, for example, the very poorest in the world can be benefited from foreign aid projects that we're capable of supplying. Now, it, to some extent, it's obvious that we should do this, and we've been doing this for many decades, but um, foreign aid has been uh, pretty unsuccessful, and it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that people have realized just how difficult it is to help people. Sometimes um, programs that seem like they should obviously work, like a vaccination program or distribution of malaria nets, don't actually work. And this is where humility comes in. One comes up with an idea like a vaccination program, and then you test it out in a country, and you see whether it works. And if it works, then you can uh, expand it. But if it doesn't work, then you have to think of something else to do. In any event, this is the sort of thing that the West can do to help people in poor countries. And I think this type of approach, if done carefully, is much more likely to benefit people around the world than imposing human rights law on them. Okay. Eric Posner, Kirkland & Ellis, Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. His new book is called The Twilight of International Human Rights. Eric Posner, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks very much. I, I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats.
we want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Democratic strategist Celinda Lake says it's not that voters rejected Democratic economics in the midterm elections. They didn't hear any. We'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Congress, which has been so tied up in a partisan knot by right-wing extremists that it has been unable to move, suddenly sprang loose at the end of the year and put on a phenomenal show of acrobatic lawmaking. In one big bipartisan spending bill, our legislative gymnast pulled off a breathtaking flat-footed backflip for Wall Street then set a dizzying new height record for the amount of money deep-pocketed donors can give to the two major political parties. It was the best scratch-my-back performance you never saw. You and I didn't see it because it happened in secret, with no public hearings, debate, or even a vote. The favor was huge, allowing Wall Street's most reckless speculators to have their losses on risky derivative deals insured by us taxpayers. Such losses were a central cause of the 2008 financial crash and subsequent unholy bank bailout, which led to the passage of the Dodd-Frank reform law to spare taxpayers from future Wall Street bailouts. But with one compact 85-line provision inserted deep inside the 1,600-page trillion-dollar spending bill, Congress did a dazzling flip-flop on that Dodd-Frank reform, putting us taxpayers back on the hook for the banksters' high-risk speculation. In this same spending bill, Congress also freed rich donors, such as Wall Street bankers, from being limited to under $100,000 on the donation that any one of them can give to political parties. In a spectacular, gravity-defying stunt, lawmakers flung the limit on these donations to a record-setting 15 times higher. So now, bankers who are grateful to either party for letting them make a killing on taxpayer-backed deals can give $1.5 million each to the parties. This is Jim Hightower saying, it's always an amazing sight when Wall Street and Congress get together, especially when they get together out of our sight. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Political strategist Celinda Lake says 2014 was a wave election, and now it is the Republicans who have to prove they can govern. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Celinda Lake is one of the Democratic Party's leading political strategists, serving as tactician and senior advisor to the National Party Committees, dozens of Democratic incumbents, and challengers at all levels of the electoral process. Celinda Lake, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you very much. It's delightful to be here. And nice to talk to you as well. So how do you explain President Obama's low poll ratings and Republican electoral gains at a time when most Americans are struggling to stay in or near the middle class? Well, I think that um, we dominate the middle class. People really think we're more in touch with their lives than Republicans. But um, what we didn't do is talk about what we're going to do to rebuild the middle class. And so, uh, and, I, and I think that was a fundamental myth. Uh, we needed to be articulating a, an economic message, an economic contrast, an economic vision. We needed it to be bold and big, and we needed that to set up the contrast with Republicans. And uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the pressure of real life events, but also by choices, uh, we did not articulate that policy and we paid a high price for it. 
why it, it seems to me anyway that, that, that people so frequently vote against their economic well-being? Are, are they simply bamboozled by trickle-down economics? Well, I don't think so. Not anymore. There was a time when they believed in trickle-down economics. They sure don't believe in it anymore. Um, but um, And I think they're a lot less able to be bamboozled. But they didn't reject democratic economics. They didn't hear any democratic economics. Mm. What was our major economic proposal? And frankly, while the policies are correct, minimum wage and equal pay do not, and paid sick days, very good policies. People supported them. People voted for them every chance they got a, uh, every opportunity they got a chance to. But that doesn't make for a major national economic policy. Mm -hmm. What, what, what sort of message did the Democrats need to come with then? I mean, what, what would that, what would that message, economic policy be? Oh, well, I'm not a policy person. I just know what tests well. Um, so okay, I don't fair know, enough. but job programs test well, um, tax reform tests well, investing in small businesses te test well, getting student loans down test well. The cost of college is just completely freaking people out. Yeah. So there are a variety of things that test well. I don't know. You know, honestly, I am, I'm not an economist. I don't play one on TV, so I have no idea what's <laughs> actually good policy or how you do it. But I do know these things all test extremely well. And as you mentioned, I mean, and, and we didn't hear any of those or, or certainly not much of, of no. any of those things that you mentioned. So um, no. We're speaking with Celinda Lake, one of the Democratic Party's leading political strategists here on America's Democrats dot org. How does it happen that Democrats seem to have the advantage in national elections but can't get elected dog catcher in much of the country? <laughs> well, actually, uh, yes, yeah, that's a really interesting question because we used to have the advantage at the state and local level. And uh, I think that phenomenon of not being able to get elected locally is frankly more true in the South, which has gone through realignment. Uh, but I think if you look... Uh, you know, it's, this was a wave election, and it affected everyone. But if you look over time, take a state like my home state, Montana. We have the governorship, but even when we haven't had the governorship, we usually have the four statewide office holders. We lost Congress and lost Senate badly this year, but we elected uh, Democrats to the Supreme Court. So I don't think it's true that we don't elect people locally. Um, we've had a couple of wave elections, 2010 and 2014, and so that's ransacked the lower level office ranks, but normally we're actually quite competitive at the lower level. The biggest difference is anymore is because the country gets more and more polarized, it's becoming more and more important who turns out to vote. And we have been able to get our coalitions out in presidential years in record numbers, and we have been unsuccessful in getting them out in non-presidential years. And that's the biggest challenge facing the party. Mm -hmm. How can Democrats energize younger voters who have so much at stake in economic and social policy, but who don't vote? So how do we get them out there? Well, I think one of the problems is that um, we got them out to vote in 2006. We got them out to vote in 2008. And then we haven't been able to get them out in non-presidential years. We still got them out in 2012. Um, but this economy has been really tough on young people. And we do talk a lot about, about making college more affordable, but we haven't really done that much. And we have students with a record amount of debt. And I think young voters have been, who have very short time frames, have been remarkably patient. But 56% of young people have been back home on the couch in this recession. They couldn't make it. Uh, they don't have jobs. They don't have good paying jobs. They can't pay off their student debt. And uh, you know what? I'm not sure we have done that much for the, on the economy for young people. We need to do more. Mm -hmm. Do you think President Obama has any chance of getting anything done in these next two years? Well, the interesting thing is, and it may be better or worse for those of us who are progressives on this call, um, is that... Um, Divided government usually is much more productive than mixed government. So actually, if you look at the, all the historical data, people who have been uh, governments that have had the House in one hand and the Senate in the other don't actually traditionally produce very much. People who <clears throat> where the House is in one hand and the president's in, or where the Congress is in one hand and the president's in another have produced much more. 
so yes, I think we are likely to be able to pass some things. I hope they're good policies, not bad policies. Um, and then the Republicans are under a lot of pressure. They got to prove they can govern. I mean, they won with all these new faces. But the reason their governors were so formidable is because those governors had to produce. And uh, that is the thing, I think, um, is we've got to show that uh, the, that party is under a lot of pressure to produce. And so we'll see. And, in fact, they've got to do it in less than two years, obviously, as campaigning starts long right. before. That's so right. Yeah, so they really have – have... a year. They yeah, got a year they've around. got a year to show something, and that's that's tough to do in any environment, I think. Uh, before we let you go, Michelle Obama, do you see a future in politics as more than a first lady? Oh, she could get elected right now, but I don't see an interest in a future in politics. And I think the world is her stage. She is truly a global and modern woman. So I'm sure we're going to see Michelle Obama lead in great things and uh, having just watched her from afar, um, it's hard for me to imagine she actually chooses running for office as a way to do that. Uh, but, boy, she'd be electable tomorrow. Okay. Celinda Lake, one of the Democratic Party's leading political strategists, joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Celinda, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, former Congressman Dennis Kucinich. In studio with us, Reed Epstein, political reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and you know, Reed, one of the voices that I miss very, very much in the debates of Congress these days is that of Congressman Dennis Kucinich. But he is uh, not going too far. He actually lives sort of in the neighborhood and run into him in the neighborhood. And he joins us on our news line this morning. Uh, Congressman, always good to talk to you. Hi, Dennis. Good morning. It's uh, great to uh, to join you on, on your show this morning. So before we get into some of the other issues you and I, I know we wanted to talk about ISIS and, and a new, new UMF. What was your reaction to the news yesterday that we are finally going to end the embargo against Cuba? Well, it's about time. Uh, the, the, the U.S. has, um, and with, particularly with the Congress, has been involved in, in passing one piece of legislation after another that uh, basically would uh, uh, deal with travel restrictions or, um, um, you know, we, we have, we've had a, a, a relationship with Cuba, which has been very negative. Uh, of course, Cuba has a poor human rights record, mm -hmm. uh, and the U.S. has been involved in, you know, in broadcasting and supporting human rights there, and uh, most of the economic sanctions have remained in place uh, through the years. And there's been a lot of the criticism of Cuba's um, repression of political dissidents. So, you know, Congress has been very involved in this, but the administration under Barack Obama has really taken, I think, a very positive step to, uh, uh, towards ending the Cold War. Of, uh, of course, Mr. Gross's release uh, played a pivotal role in this, but uh, it's about time. Yeah, long Certainly that strategy hasn't worked for the last 50 years. It's time to try a different strategy. That's what the president announced yesterday. Um, so are we, I want to ask you, let's, let's shift to the Middle East, particularly this war against ISIS. Are we involved in an illegal war uh, now against ISIS? Do you believe? Well, there, there, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the U.S. has, uh, has uh, been involved, uh, at least indirectly, in helping to fund ISIS, uh, that the series of causal links that have found the U.S. involved in that region uh, inevitably uh, have, have led to uh, ISIS uh, getting a lot of uh, U.S. material and, uh, and becoming emboldened because of the U.S.'s uh, uh, wrongheaded uh, international policy. It's, it's very interesting to see this development in Cuba because it, it 
it portends that uh, uh, the United States has the capacity to get to move away from the, its cold warrior stance. It's it, what is also ironic is that the sanctions bill with respect to Russia it will probably be signed by the president if it hasn't already. And that, in a, in a, in a large manner, is a, re, is a renewal and intensification of Cold War uh, practices and psychology. So we're still seeing this teeter-totter mm-hmm. in foreign policy and, of course, Russia's role in, uh, uh, in uh, being a um, protector of Syria plays a part in this. Uh, in, in the U.S. conduct towards right. Russia, as well as Russia's singular position but speci- as a counterbalance. So, but specifically with with ISIS, you know, the president contends that he has all the authority he needs under the uh, 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 the authorization for the use of military force passed after September 11 to conduct this campaign, this military campaign against ISIS. Well, I would disagree with that. It, one of the problems that we've seen in the last uh, couple decades is an erosion of Article One responsibilities with respect to the Congress. Uh, Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution makes it abundantly clear that uh, it is Congress that has the power to take the country into war. And, the, and no president should be able to, at his uh, uh, whim or instance uh, uh, or calculation, be able to use the military resources of the United States in specific actions without having a clear uh, consensus uh, and, and a vote in the United States Congress. So I disagree totally that uh, that this president or any president should be able to commit this country to uh, uh, to a war, uh, either uh, serial, sequential, or uh, or uh, temporary, uh, to um, uh, 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 without Congress being involved. It's it's really a um, Except, you know, it's a, it's a question, it's a constitutional question, and in a way we have a constitutional crisis here where Congress has not stepped up to its responsibility and the president fills a vacuum mm-hmm. uh, through his own uh, use of executive power. Congressman, uh, what's your sense of how important an issue uh, foreign policy, particularly the Middle East, is going to play in the next presidential election? Uh, you know, typically it's not been a front burner issue uh in the last go round uh was sort of fenced off into half of one debate and that was similarly the rest of it but do you see what's going on in 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 Iraq and Syria uh at this moment as something that's on on the minds of of a whole lot of voters uh heading into 2016 uh only if somebody makes it that way doesn't necessarily happen i mean people right now are focused on their their, um, on, on their wages, their income, their ability to survive financially. I think that the uh, congressional tax on Wall Street have had some resonance, although y- you don't really see it filter into policy. That's still upside down. But when it comes to foreign policy, it's the big kahuna of, U- of U.S. Uh, spending, the money that goes for wars, the money that goes for uh, our military presence across the world. We really are, are in a crisis in America where we have to we have to ask what is our appropriate role in the world? Are we continuing to try to advance an American imperium? Do we have the right to have military bases all around the world as kind of an advanced position in connection with that? Uh, what about this massive spying operation that we have that has not only uh, touched the lives of, uh, of of people all across the globe, but in particular is touching our own lives? You cannot have the kind of uh, rise of military power and extension, expansion of it, without seeing uh, negative effects on our own uh, country with respect to an undermining of our democratic status. So, yes, foreign policy ought to be a major issue. So but who's, who's going to make it a major issue? Well, that remains to be seen. I, haven't, I, I don't know. It's, it certainly uh, is not uh, going to be um, uh, Secretary Clinton because she's been an architect of a lot of these policies. Uh, and uh, it's 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 unlikely to be Jeb Bush. His family has been very much involved in in these policies. So I I think that we're looking at a um, at, at a vacuum of policy which uh, remains to be filled. And if somebody can make the connections between uh, the decline of America's capacity to meet its own needs and the trillions of dollars that are spent in wars that are based on lies or misrepresentations and the uh, erosion of democratic principles here at home through the CIA's uh, uh, policies and the NSA's practices, 
Uh, yeah, I think that could be a very salient issue. But is, that, is that something that you're interested in doing? Look, I do it whether I'm a candidate for office or not. Are you, are you, you thinking know? about running for president again? No, no, no I'm not. I, I think that there's uh, – uh, but uh, one does not have to be a candidate for president to be able to uh, not just talk about these issues, but to uh, help organize people around taking a new approach. Look, I ran for president in 2004 specifically because the United States had uh, lied to take us into a war. Right. And, and uh, Mr. Kerry got the nomination, and his first uh, act as the uh, nominee was to basically give a military salute that sent a signal to uh, all those who were players in that, don't worry about it, business as usual. The Democratic Party has really failed to keep its promises to the American people to take a new direction in foreign policy. And, and the Republican Party has been pretty consistent in, in uh, supporting the militarization of the U.S. Uh, uh, budget. Uh, I, I was going to make that point that certainly when you were a candidate for president, uh, Congressman, th- that was a major plank of yours, particularly opposition to the war in Iraq and, and continuing questions about the war in Afghanistan. Now that you look, when you look at Afghanistan and Iraq today, what does that tell us about um, our foreign policy? I mean, you know, the, the, both of those wars. Tells us that we ought to start minding our own business here at home. That we don't have the ability to direct or or force anybody to live any particular way. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have an interest. That doesn't mean we shouldn't work with the world community to uh, try to encourage people to take a new direction. But this idea that somehow we can use will, use force to impose on, on other uh, countries uh, our particular approach, and we know our hands aren't clean. I mean, when you look at at the fact that we wage war based on lies. When you look at the CIA, uh, the Senate torture report on the CIA, when you see that the NSA is basically um, uh, without restraint and runs amok, uh, you have to ask yourself, what right do we have to go around the world preaching to others about a democracy when we, when we don't even practice it here at home? So we have to really come to uh, grips with our own responsibilities. Uh, uh, you know, the, um, th- there's a line in the Bible that says something like, uh, you know, before you uh, take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of your own. And we really have a, have a problem of, of a lack of conscious reflection on our policies and on the impact of the policies. Uh, it's Congressman Dennis Kucinich, uh, not, no longer in Congress, but still a strong voice out there. And thanks so much for sharing that uh, voice with us this morning here on the program. Thanks, Congressman. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Take all right. care. Happy holidays to you. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Eric Posner, Celinda Lake, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate.